Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I think I see one or two folks coming in the back door here. So welcome. Uh, it'll feel better. You'll feel cooler after you sit for a minute or so. It's dreadfully hot. Thank you for making the trek through the heat to join us this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is John Culshaw. I'm the Jack B. King University Librarian, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to our 2022 uh, Friends of the Library event. Um, it's been it's been a long time since we were together, uh, and it's really wonderful to see everybody in person today. Uh, we've been in virtual for the last two years. Uh, but we're really glad to be back and to be here in person and have the opportunity to uh, to learn about the conservation work that's happened on some of our presidential portraits uh, here in our life in the gallery in the libraries. So I want to thank you as friends of the library for your support uh, for your advocacy year in and year out, and I know that many of you are also supporters of the gold rush campaign that we used to raise the funds to do the conservation work on these portraits so thank you very much for that today we're going to hear from art conservator sarah bosen about her work on conserving two of iowa's presidential portraits before we start i do want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land we are on today has a long history the university campus and this library building are located on the homelands of 16 tribal nations. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, understanding the historical and current experiences of Native peoples will help inform the work that we do. So before we talk about the presidential portraits, I do just want to take one moment, and I'd like to thank all of the library staff who are here today. If you are a library's employee, would you please just stand for a minute? Thank you so much for everything you do. It's good to have you here with us today as well. And you know, all of these events like this, putting the gallery together, uh, doing everything else we do in the library is all due to our fantastic staff. And you know, I say again and again that people are our most important resource and the folks that you just acknowledged are indeed that very most important resource. We also have a few partners here from the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. If I could ask you to stand for a moment as well. Thank you for the work that you do to help us uh, do the work of, of providing information resources to the university community. I'd also like to take a quick moment to recognize the members of our Libraries Advancement Council who are in attendance with us today. We formed this group during the pandemic, and this is the first time several of our members have met in person. Uh, it's not a formal meeting of our council, uh, but we're really glad to have some of those members with us here today. So let me start with, with our chair, Leanne Lemberger. And Leanne, you're the chair for what? About 15 more days until the end of the fiscal year, I think? Yeah, so Leanne is from Ottumwa, Iowa. Our vice chair is Aaron Schaefer from here in Iowa City, and he's up in the top deck. Our incoming chair is Jane Roth, who's here with us from Leesburg, Virginia. Incoming vice chair, sorry. And last but not least, another member of the council, Christy Krugler, who's here with us from Milwaukee. So a little background on the Presidential Portrait Gallery, which is located on the fifth floor of the library. And if you haven't been up there, I would encourage you to take a moment today. 
uh, to go up. You can come anytime that the library is open. Uh, and of course, if you haven't had a chance to look at the, uh, the exhibit in the gallery next door on the 175th anniversary of the university and, uh, and student activity over that course of time, I would encourage you to make a stop in the gallery as well. So the gallery on the fifth floor is a place to celebrate the university's history and to feature artists' original portraits of the university's past presidents. When I arrived on campus in 2013, the portraits really needed a great amount of care, and there was not a complete set of, of, of the past presidents. Most importantly, our female leaders were missing from that set of portraits. We now have 20 portraits, all of which are part of the university archives. The portraits are displayed with an overview of each leader's tenure and accompanying images showing the campus during that time period. They're not just works of art. It's really living history and a way to track that history and make it available to students, faculty, and the community. That's why it was really important for, to the libraries to make a campaign, to hold the Gold Rush campaign, to raise some funds, and then find the best paintings conservator possible for the collection. And that search led us to Sarah Boson. Sarah, who's from Des Moines, worked on the portraits of Oliver Spencer and Josiah Picard. And here they are over to my left. They required the most complex conservation efforts of those that are featured in the gallery. Sarah is a professional art conservator with a postgraduate diploma in painting conservation from the Court Ald Institute of Art in London and a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design. SCAD, I love that place and I love the store. We were there a couple of years ago. It's a, it's a great institution. Sarah has more than 10 years of combined experience working with well-respected professionals in the field and has worked on a wide range of works of art by North American, South American and European artists. They ranged in age from the 15th to the 21st century. And she says, even what may appear to be a destroyed work of art can often be brought back to life. Educational training in conservation includes an extensive understanding of the chemistry of paintings and how to safely treat them without adverse effects. It's a field that is constantly evolving in research and knowledge for the conservation and preservation of art. So today we're thrilled to have Sarah discuss her work and why it's so important to preserve history. And you'll also have an opportunity for questions and you can even get up here and take a look at these paintings before we're over uh, this afternoon. So with that, Sarah, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Okay, let me make sure everything's running here. Okay. Uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, the portraits I treated, like they said, are up here on display. And after uh, my presentation and questions, you'll be welcome to come up, take a closer look and um, ask me any further questions you may have. Um, I'm going to begin my talk today by discussing what conservation is and give a couple examples of some very deteriorated um, works that were then treated and what can conservation can do for those types of pieces um, before continuing on to discuss the condition and treatment of the two presidential portraits. Okay, maybe everything's working. Oh, try this. There we go. Okay. Conservation encompasses all those actions taken toward the long term preservation of cultural heritage. Activities include examination, documentation, treatment, and preventative care, supported by research and education. 
This comes from a culmination of skills, the fine arts, art history, and chemistry. The term restoration is often mistakenly used by people outside the field. This is not something I correct people on, it's just how most people refer to this type of work. Restoration is actually the attempt to return an artifact back to its original condition. By contrast, conservation attempts to preserve an artifact in its current condition, focusing first off on the stabilization of an artifact and then, depending on the work, addressing the visual integration of the piece. The goal is not to make the work look new, but to put it on, for it to be put on display as a cohesive whole without erasing its age. Conservation has evolved over the centuries. It was once the job typically carried out by other artists, which followed more along the lines of restoration. In more recent times, as the chemistry of art has developed, uh, the profession has become more knowledgeable about the processes being carried out and the profession uh, was created in its own field. Um, this often was taught to the next generation through apprenticeship. In present day, if you want to get into conservation, uh, the requirements include a master's degree or the equivalent in the field that you're wishing to enter. Um, in my case, painting conservation specifically. Um, so the field is constantly changing and we're learning things from both the medical field and the science field that help us better understand the pieces we are treating. Now, to give you an idea of what is possible, this painting was damaged by water, which caused the canvas to shrink overall. Um, while the canvas was able to shrink, the paint itself does not shrink. So then there was overlap in the paint layers, which you can see, whoops, whoops. You can see these peaks where the paint has overlapped. Also, you see significant losses and some tears um, as a result of the damage, um, of the water damage. Uh, I'll, you also had grime and varnish discoloring everything. Uh, many people may consider this possibly uh, lost hope. Uh, it also wasn't on a stretcher at the time. So it had, it had a long way to go to get back to life. Here in the mid-treatment photo, you can see that the varnish and grime have been addressed. The tears were mended. I know you can't see those, they're underneath some fills. Um, but we are also able to restretch the canvas in areas that where the paint needed to go back down. So those lines that were in the sky from those cracks are much less noticeable. The losses were filled and textured to mimic the artist's brushwork and give continuity to that. As a result, once in painted, you have a completed piece that is stable, first and foremost, able to be hung on a wall and in, enjoyed by the viewer. Another case, this portrait, it had been previously treated. Um, it has significant tears in it. It was lined, um, the tears were mended, and then there was damage that was in painted. Now the in painting has discolored with time. That is very common. Um, paints age at different rates. Uh, and But I also found that some of it was not very flattering to the original work. Um, it was also found that some of the original painting was not cleaned fully likely due to some sensitivity in their cleaning solvent to the original paint layer. So here in the mid treatment, you can see I've removed all the varnish. I was even able to remove the old varnish that was left behind just by slowly testing and carefully um, figuring out what solution was safest with the paint that is there. And then you see areas such as this, which were heavily abraded with previous cleaning. This is likely why they stopped their previous cleaning. So you also, 
floss some of the chin. In the background, it's kind of hard to see, but there was almost just islands of paint because so much around it had been removed. Also, there's a hand down here that you could not see before treatment, and it's very abraded, but it was starting to come forward with all this, all the cleaning. And here you see the outline of the tears that had been treated. Again, the, these losses were filled and textured um, in preparation for end painting. Another fun thing that came out with cleaning is there's a little pentimento where the artist moved where the, this figure's head was. Hopefully you can see that there. And then after treatment, um, I was able to bring things to a more cohesive whole. Um, you'll see that the figure now sits forward of the background um, and stands on his own. And hopefully the lighting works so that you can see the hand on the, um, on the wine bottle there. But those are a couple examples of some pieces that really need some TLC and were able to be brought back to life. So when it came to treatment of the University of Iowa's presidential portraits, um, most of what I had to address was aesthetic issues. Um, the painting of Oliver Spencer required a moderate amount of conservation work. Uh, the painting uh, had previously been treated and much like that last piece I showed you, the end painting had aged, discolored, it wasn't flattering anymore. Um, and it also had some missteps, I would like to say. Uh, overall, the varnish had also darkened and yellowed, making Mr. Spencer look rather sallow. Uh, and the treatment included the following, grime cleaning, varnish removal, an attempt at setting down some cracks, a uh, modification of wax fills, applying a new varnish, filling losses, and in painting areas of loss and abrasion. This is a photograph of the back of the painting. Uh, this painting was lined likely in the 1970s. Wax linings were very common in and around the 70s. It was a treatment that was able to stabilize very, um, very fragile pieces, often pieces with uh, large tears in them. And also the stretcher is a typical spring stretcher dating back to the, about the 1970s as well. So I'm able to date when this last conservation treatment is relatively closely. Um, and, then, and here in a transmitted light photo, you can see so this is still the back of the canvas, but you can see the extent of the tear that was being mended through this lining. And then also all this around it, that uh, is paint loss that you can see through the back. Due to, due to the extensive damage to the painting um, and the treatment it had undergone, uh, I had to look at it very closely with lots of magnification in different lighting um, to assess what was safest to move forward with this treatment. Um, the goal in conservation is never to do any damage. And sometimes the best option is to leave something alone. And that is an option you always wanna leave on the table. Is this the time to treat something or is it better to wait until maybe some other developments come along? You never know. Um, but I was able to safely say that yes, this painting could be treated and should be treated. Um, now, there are several things that you can ho hopefully see better here in this um, brightened uh, detail photo that I found rather disturbing about the facial features. Uh, the nose was quite flat. Uh, also the mouth and mustache seemed rather muddled. The ear is 
this is original paint here, and this is in painted down here. So the tones are not matching there. Also, I discovered that the end of the ear is actually right about there. It's about a whole centimeter lower than where it's depicted here. And also, if you're in art classes and doing life drawing, your proportions, your ear should be, the bottom of the ear should line up with the mouth. So in, in case I was wondering at all, that helps solidify that. Um, also, the side of the forehead here blends very much with the background, making, you can't tell what's background, what's figure anymore. So those were all things I was looking at very closely, knowing that this was very heavily repainted or inpainted in the past. Uh, varnish. Varnish is very important to paintings. Um, it gives a protective coating. It helps with cleaning in the future. Um, it has a lot of benefits to the painting, provides saturation. Here is an ultraviolet light photo of the painting. Uh, ultraviolet light can tell us a lot of different things. In this case, it's fluorescing a blue, a milky blue tone. That's indicative of a synthetic resin varnish. Now, knowing that, it helps guide me with what solvents I should be trying to use to remove it. So it's very helpful. And then also, if you notice, it's not an even coating. It's darker in through the face and just around the head. So in painting is carried out on top of varnish layers. That uh, paint on top of the varnish then blocks that fluorescence, creating darkening. So there again is a suggestion to me that this has been heavily in painted in the past. And here is a time lapse video showing the removal of uh, the varnish. Uh, now there's both a synthetic resin varnish and then underneath is a natural resin varnish that I, and I removed both. So you see all the damage coming forward just where like the ultraviolet light showed it. And here we're going back to remove the rest of the natural resin. kind of clearing everything up and so you can see there's quite a puzzle left. Uh, now, just so you're aware, I was fairly certain it was going to look something like this when I was done. I didn't jump in and I, I wasn't surprised by this. <laughs> um, so a lot of loss. A lot of a lot of damage, but that did not scare me. There are still several areas that can give me suggestions of where things are. Here's another transmitted light photo showing um, those tears, and all those really light areas are areas that I couldn't put a commercial gesso on because there was too much wax there. Um, there was so much wax in that wax lining that in areas of cracking paint that I tried to set down, there wasn't any room for the paint to go. Uh, that wax had filled that void between the paint and the canvas. Um, also in the losses, it had filled those losses. So there was no room for me to put a textured white gesso. Um, and unfortunately it's harder to in paint on top of wax, but you do what you have to do. Uh, here in this close up, you can see suggestions of the where the mustache sits and a little suggestion of the lip. You see suggestion of the nose. You also know how wide the bridge is there. You've got a good part of the eye to go by. Um, I'm at a weird angle here. Uh, but there is a suggestion of the ear down here. Just guide points to help me with that reconstruction. Additionally, the library was able to provide me with a couple of portraits of Spencer. This was very helpful. Between those guide points that I had and then these images, I was able to see 
better what he looks like and bring him back to life. Um, honestly, I feel like the portrait's kind of a culmination of these two. Uh, and some of the things I was able to correct are his hair and how it lays over the ear. Um, I was able to get a better look at the eyes and the lines underneath, the shape of the nose, how big and bushy that mustache is and how that little bit of lip just sticks out. That was all very informative to my in-painting process. And here is the after treatment photo. Hopefully you see a reflection of some of those characteristics I just pointed out um, and a more holistic view altogether. Here's in much larger detail for you. And then side by side. Um, again, you've lost that sallow yellow appearance from the varnishes and everything. Also, you'll notice that his suit looks crisp and clean. Um, even the top of the collar, the highlight on it is setting a little bit better. And if you look closely, uh, the direction that his eyes are gazing in the before treatment, he was actually kind of looking past the viewer. Well, I found in the remains of the eye that I had to reconstruct that he was actually looking at the viewer. So there's a slight shift there as well. So that is Mr. Spencer. Mr. Pickard was more straightforward. He, it, a lovely portrait that just had a few issues, um, kind of what we typically would call um, general cleanup. So here in this detail, you can see there's a couple of blemishes to the varnish. Um, and there's some dark in painting here under his nose. So additionally, the, it has an overall yellow cast from, that nat from a natural resin varnish coating the surface. The back of the canvas looked perfectly fine. Uh, the tension was good. The canvas is in good shape. So it's very structurally sound. Here in the partially cleaned um, photo, you see how just how yellowed and aged that natural resin varnish had become. Um, the painting is entering into what we consider a varnish cycle. This is very common. It, Paintings have been going through them for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, a varnish only lasts 50 years, give or take, before it gets too dark. And so then it was, it's always been very common to take one varnish off and put a fresh one on. So that is essentially what is going on here. It's very common practice. Um, and you also see a little bit of fill in the mid-treatment photo. Um, but he's much brighter. He's standing forward of the background and he's got great little curls in his beard and his glasses just pop. And then if, when you see the before and after side by side, I feel like he's about to walk out of that portrait. Um, it was a lovely, pleasant treatment to uh, go down or go along with while I was also working on Spencer, kind of. Nice to jump back and forth. Um, so I do wanna also talk about a couple of other things. So just for personal care of anybody's own art collection, a um, couple of guidelines. Uh, try not to let your works be uh, hung in direct sunlight. If you can, uh, UV filtered glass is always good. Both of these portraits have backing boards on them and are under UV filtered plexiglass to help protect them front and back. That backing board also helps mitigate environmental fluctuations. Um, also don't hang uh, works of art um, above or below radiators or cooling vents that you don't want those drastic changes in temperatures. Also interior walls are better than exterior walls for the same reason. And then I also caution you whenever handling your artwork, make sure you have a clear path to walk around 
And if you're setting the painting on the floor, uh, try to have a cardboard or something to cover it up so that someone doesn't accidentally kick it. Um, ac accidents happen. They come across my studio all the time. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the university and the uh, libraries. It's been great to work with them. And thank you all for joining me tonight. Any questions? So Spencer took a little over 30 hours. Um, Picard was, I think, about 10 hours, give or take. Yeah. Um, I would, worked on a collaborative piece. Um, the, Italian wedding chest that you would have seen a picture of earlier. Uh, we spent a total of around 500 hours on that. Yeah. So there are two types of varnishes typically used. There's a few others, but typically two. You have your natural resin which have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's what the old masters all used. And then you have your synthetic resin, which much more modern 20th century um, production. Now, some people would argue that a natural resin provides a nicer saturation, but the downside of that is a natural resin varnish, varnish can cross-link with oil paints, making it harder to remove over time. So you could potentially be getting into um, a situation where you can't remove that varnish. Um, it would, you would end up removing paint layers along with it. Synthetic resin varnishes require solvents that are much easier on your oil paint. So they're easier to remove without um, risk of damage. Now, anytime we're removing a varnish, you're doing tiny tests with different solvent um, combinations to find the safest, most effective way to remove the varnish. Um, but again, if you can use that synthetic varnish in the long run, your painting's likely going to be safer. That being said, when I go to varnish something, I always do several tests at different percentages and different types of varnish to see what uh, saturates the painting best and is most sympathetic to the piece. Um, if the only thing that works is a natural resin varnish, then that may be the way forward as well. Yeah. So for, for those of us who have paintings on outside walls, above a heating vent, without plexiglass over the foil, how do you recommend we clean those pieces of art? Uh, bring them to me. <laughs> I, I do. Okay, so I know there are a lot of videos out there that show how great and easy uh, cleaning paintings are. Don't do it. <laughs> I have had more pieces come into my studio lately than you would think possible because someone's like, oh yeah, I watched this video and I'm going to just, no, it's always best to seek uh, at least a consultation and see what could pop be possible before trying to do anything yourself. But if if possible, it's not always possible to hang something in an ideal situation. But when possible, try to avoid some of those things. <laughs> yes. Um, like the or yes, so they've, uh, yeah, let's stick with the Louvre. All of those have a condition report and most likely a treatment report as well. Those paintings have probably undergone several treatments, most of them. Um, I will say the Mona Lisa is one that has not, it, ha it has been treated but not to the extent that they treat most pieces. It still has several layers of varnish because no one wants to risk possibly removing even a little bit of that original paint. It's 
really interesting how they look at it. it yeah. Yes. Oh, great question. So acrylic paintings can have um, a different set of issues because of their solubility parameters. They can be much harder to clean. Uh, typically, they don't have a varnish on them, though there, there are acrylic varnishes as well. Those are not readily reversible without damaging the original paint. So it, the biggest issue with cleaning them is a sensitivity issue. There are molecular cleaning solutions that have been um, created recently that make it easier to slowly and at least somewhat clean them, but it is a, a bit of a sticky situation with them. Otherwise they do can, they have some of the same issues with tears and losses, um, those types of things that can be addressed very similarly. So if a pigment or color has altered with time, we do not adjust it back to the color it used to be. Um, Van, several Van Gogh paintings have lost some of their pigment. Um, they were very fugitive pigments and have faded with time. You don't, uh, conservators do not go back in and revitalize that pigment. Um, Rothko's is another example. Many of his paintings, because of the complex layering he used, they've faded and no longer look the way they originally did. One way people have addressed that is with um, projecting lights onto them to give it semblance of what it originally looked like. So sometimes doing mock-ups or digital renderings is a way to showcase what it would have originally looked like without affecting the original. Any other questions? Yeah. What would cause tears into the canvas? I'm curious. Uh, I so everything from uh, in a museum, an easel went through. Um, I've heard ping pong paddles, swords, um, fists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's almost always an accident some kind of human, as we call human error. Um, yeah, just, just an accident usually. <laughs> yes? So a uh, painting structure is typically made up of your canvas or board. If it's a canvas, it's often stretched onto a stretcher. On top of that, there would be a sizing layer, some type of glue, followed by a gesso layer, which is a white ground glue mixture. And then that's the surface they would paint on. So when you have paint losses, often you're exposing that ground layer or all the way down to that canvas layer. And then I am putting a commercial gesso, something very similar to like a uh, putty you would use to fill in holes on your wall to fill in and bring it uh, the lost level with the surrounding area. I also will carve in brush strokes um, or any kind of texture that needs to be there um, because the end painting I do, the types of paints we use is very thin. So that's not adding very much bulk. So I have to mimic those brush strokes ahead of time. Anything else? Yeah. So no, not all pieces are varnished. Um, impressionist artwork is a type of artwork that is traditionally not varnished. Um, so if you are able to find out how an artist typically treated their artwork, were they known for varnishing something? 
that would be the direction you go. So if, if I have a painting that comes into my studio that has never been varnished, I do not want to apply a varnish because that changes the artist's intent. Now, in reverse, a painting that has always been varnished, I would always re-varnish as well. Again, artist's intent. Um, unfortunately, some pieces, uh, impressionist paintings often were varnished in uh, studios at uh, later dates, wanting to protect them because varnish does provide a protective layer. Well, realizing down the road that it was changing the intent and how a piece was viewed, those are now somewhat being taken off. Unfortunately, that can also sometimes change how they're seen as well. Um, there, conservation is constantly evolving. We only know what we know at the time and we do the best we can, but we're always eager to learn and evolve the field, so. All right, if you guys want, anyone wants to come up and take a closer look, I know the portraits will also be over at the dinner here in a little bit. Um, or if you have any other questions to come up and ask me. Oh, yeah. Of the other printed portraits, how many? Um, so when I came to examine these, there were five others that uh, I put in proposals for treatment as well. Um, none of them are to the level of Spencer. <laughs> They're all much, to a much lesser degree, so. And that not all of them, but the removal of grime and a new layer or new coating of varnish does provide that depth of field that artists were often trying to achieve. Now, like in, in Picard's um, portrait, a lot of that is due to the technique used by the artists. Like, I seriously feel like I can just take those glasses off. <laughs> I, I, I really liked his portrait. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, nope. um, no matter the subject matter, you address it the same way. Yep, you're looking at all, and you look at all levels of it. You're looking at that canvas the support of it, the ground layer, the paint layer, the varnish layer, any grind, any damage to it in any way and um, taking a holistic approach to the whole, just like going to the doctor, holistic. So the conservation is not in like specializing in like yoga support? No, um, some people may, uh, but typically it's within one department. So I'm a painting conservator. There's also book and paper. There's photographs. There's objects, which objects can be quite a wide range. And people will specialize within objects, um, cultural heritage, uh, building, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the formations? Um, so I worked on an airplane model by Alexander Calder that you would have seen earlier. That was the last piece he created before he passed away. So that's one of my favorites. How big was that? Um, it was about five feet long, somewhere in there. That's hard to tell from the photo you shared. It, it, it was big. It, it was a fun challenge and the history with it. I have video of him painting that. So it, you know, a lot of exciting details there. Um, yeah, I, but yeah, I've worked on war halls and, oh, now of course names are escaping me, but a little bit of everything, everything 15th century to present day. And one of the things I find exciting is whether it's a well-known artist or just an heirloom painting, there's something special about each of them. So there's always something exciting about it. And the excitement of, that the client has for the piece is also great. So, okay, let's see. <laughs> um, about 10 years, 
a little more, um, including my pre-program experience. So, yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. Sharon, thank you so much. For all of us in the libraries are really grateful for your help in helping us conserve these pieces of university history. Uh, it's it's really just remarkable, and you know what a what a gift to the university to do this in the 175th anniversary year. And uh, I think we'll probably talk with you about some of those others <laughs> and how fortunate for us in Iowa to have you just down the street in Des Moines. So thank you also for this little bit of free consulting service that you provided to all of us. So uh, I love to educate. So <laughs> so thank you again so much. Thank you. So that is it for our program this afternoon. I would I would encourage you to come on down and take a look at the portraits up close and personal. Uh, there's a ramp on this side, and be careful on the stairs on this side. Uh, but please come and come up on the stage and have a look. And I know Sarah would be glad to visit with you.